Episode 3 begins with the gang out in the town, going shopping. There, they help a beast girl reunite with her older sister, and Toya gets a new coat. Honestly, with how much this is in the marketing and in the theme song, I kind of thought that this new coat would have had a flashier introduction to the story, but eh, whatever. The next day, Toya and Gang are reined in at the guild, where he introduces some people to Shogi. Some of the girls bring over some sweets, and he delivers some of that to the Duke with the gate spell. There, he introduces the Duke to Shogi, which he insists on playing with Toya for the entire day, leaving Toya exhausted. The gang fast travels to the capital to grab some new quests, and wind up on an extermination mission to fight a Dulahan, which they swiftly eliminate. They decide that, since they are in some ruins, they might as well search for treasure, and they stumble upon a cave. Toya takes pictures of the ancient inscriptions, and then the gang accidentally awaken a powerful monster. They defeat the monster and then report to the Duke, who wants to research this cave, but said cave is now destroyed. However, the day is saved because Toya has the inscriptions on his phone and can use null magic to create physical copies of them. But when he goes to deliver them to the Duke, the Duke tells him that there is urgent news. His brother is sick. And with that out of the way, let's jump into the analysis. The first thing I want to do is actually offer some very slight praise to this story for what it's doing with the structure of its narrative. Episode 3 was something of a slice-of-life adventure that incorporated details from the previous two episodes in a variety of ways. Between the antics with the side characters and the mini-adventures they went on, this episode does what I feel a lot of stories could do a better job with, which is to say, establishing a comfy status quo. But... When you establish a good status quo, there is a little bit more to it than just making it comfy. What is remarkable to me about the first section of the story with the shopping and the shogi is how little it gets done with the characters. While we establish that the characters are indeed around and still doing the things that we know they do, that they are in contact with old friends and that their actions have had persistent effects on the world, none of that is imbued with any meaning. Like, we learn that he introduced these guys to Shogi, but so? Is Shogi important to Toya? Are the concepts of strategy and tactics important to his worldview? Has he, through introducing this, changed the ways that the people around him lived their lives? You know, besides that they play Shogi now? Take as another example him getting a new coat. A whole scene is dedicated to introducing him and this coat. It gives him resistance to all elements he has affinities for, which is all elements, so it's setting up for him to be even more overpowered. But does this show how being through combat has made him more cautious, such that he'd seek out such protection? Is he so much of a gamer that he's nerding out at the chance to min-max? Have his recent successes left him conscious of his image and wanting to come off as cool? And like, what of the other three protagonists here? They fetched some dessert, they had some very slight banter with Toya, but how are they doing? Why didn't we catch up with them and how they're feeling? Why not have some nice one-on-one -on -one scenes to build character dynamics? Instead of him playing Shogi with a duke, why didn't Toya play Shogi with Elise or Linz and further his dynamic with them? The story is just really bad with time, and doesn't understand a lot of basic story conventions, such as how you're supposed to use downtime in your stories to establish character. It's as if the author sees a story purely as a series of events, and scenes as those events happening. He wants there to be a scene where Toya gets the coat, so he writes a scene where the coat shows up, and then he thinks of the next thing he wants to happen. This is obviously not how it works. There's more to it than that. When Aaron was first getting to know his seniors in the Survey Corps, that wasn't just introducing new characters. It was exploring the idea of Aaron getting new people to potentially lose one day. It was about the ways they treated him, the ways Aaron was seen now that he was known to be a titan. You don't just put in a thing that needs to happen, you think of all the things you want to get done, and then find a way to do them in unison. The principal problem here, though, doesn't seem to be a failure to understand the concept of subtext, it's more of a lack of interest in it. Proper characterization and development for the characters are absent not due to the author not knowing how to include them, but because they just weren't a priority. It is the polar opposite of those stories that throw in a bunch of faux-deep conversations at random times in an attempt to be intellectual. 
such as Darling in the Franks. If you want to see me tear into that show, then you can check out my Patreon, where I'm uploading a giant video on it in parts as I create them. Moving on to the fight scenes, the one with the Dulahan was actually pretty good, and the one against the Crystal Monster had some decent action as well, but the way it is beaten is pretty odd. So despite having access to every Null Magic, Toya can't seem to defeat this thing because most of his Null Magic thus far has been fairly utility-oriented, and he hasn't learned many that are better for combat. That's fine, I actually kinda like that. Next, we get the thing that everyone is expecting when watching this fight. Toya will think of some moment from earlier in the episode that gives him an idea, and this idea is using one of his Null Magics in a novel way, and everyone watching is thinking the same thing. He's not gonna use that teleport an object into your hand spell to grab the enemy's weak point from inside it, is he? That would, of course, be the lamest way to do this, and it is what the story does. Toya thinks of the obvious idea that 100% should not work. Like, by this logic, he could teleport someone's heart out of their body to kill them. And what makes it even worse is that the thing that gave him the idea is that Shogi has you capturing the king, which just doesn't work as an analogy. It's not clever, the ideas are not that well connected or associated, it's a respectable attempt at writing this kind of scene, but it needed a second draft. I love this kind of stuff, but this is just a terrible example of this trope. One thing I found a little odd is when they just decided to douse the area for treasures. It didn't feel like it was a part of any of their characters, but rather just a result of the genre. This is an RPG-inspired setting and story, and so the idea of checking for any collectibles you missed is part of the fantasy, but we don't get any hints that these girls would be compelled to do this, or that this is a normal thing to do in this setting, or that there's some greater reason for doing so. It's just taken as a given that this is a thing to do. The characters are being puppeteered by the genre. One last thing that particularly bothered me, at least that I plan on talking about this episode, is the way the story handles its lore and the mysteries surrounding it. We get told that these ruins are the old capital of this nation, and later in the episode we learn that how the old capital got destroyed has become lost history. That is an interesting concept, but it's weighed down by the fact that no one could possibly care like, this capital isn't the capital of a nation with history and culture and importance to the characters. It is the vague concept of a capital city within the vague concept of a nation within the vague concept of a fantasy world with which to have knowingly archetypical adventures. We are asked, in no uncertain terms, to understand this world in terms of tropes and cliches, to accept that it has been hand-waved away. We are expected to view this world of ours as a means to an end. I suppose that a mystery with an interesting premise is, in a sense, an end, but it is a mystery devoid of any import, emotional value, or tension. Like, who could possibly care? You made sure that we couldn't. If you want to keep watching me lose my mind at this show and others like it, then like and subscribe with notifications on. Leave a comment telling me what you thought of the episode, and if you want to support me, my Patreon is in the description. Like I said, I am working on a video about Darling and the Franks and posting it in parts as I create them. And of course, a big fat thank you to my patrons, Bellman and Carolyn Vig. Couldn't do it without you.